crown jewels of our collection and has been for even before we were even open to the public is our star of India, the B24J Liberator. And I'll let Angie give you a little bit of the background on, uh, on its service before it came into our hands. Right, so this was one of the aircraft that were sent to the Royal Air Force and used, well, supposed to be used as essentially maritime patrol. It would not have had the ball turret in it. It would have had the search radar for anti-shipping and anti-submarine patrols. As far as we can tell, it never actually got assigned to an RAF squadron when it was over there. It probably went to a replacement depot, or if it did get assigned to squadrons, it, it, the paperwork never got caught up with it because we've been told that it was assigned to a couple of squadrons, but we've gotten the records for both those squadrons yeah. and it doesn't show up in no, anything. No, and people smarter than us on this airplane have researched for 40 years trying to establish its history and have come up empty. So uh, the best we can do is pick it up um, where it left off after the war. Right. And it was one of the better airframes that was left behind um, in India and, and continued on its maritime reconnaissance with the RAF until the fall of the Raj. Uh, when the English uh, abandoned India, um, 18 of these aircraft were left behind. Um, they were gently uh, demilitarized by having their wheels retracted and set on trestles at Pune Airfield and walked away from. Uh, shortly thereafter, the newly formed Indian Air Force rolled in, picked the airplanes up, put them on their gear, uh, repainted the rondelles and markings on them, and put them into service for another 20 years. Right, and then they got, it was like 1968, they started retiring them, uh, replacing them with uh, Russian bears. And we, as a fledgling museum that wasn't even a museum yet, was just a handful of aircraft over at Davis Mountain Air Force Base and with the board of directors. The Indian Air Force sent out a, a call around the world saying, hey, oh, okay. we have these aircraft that are retiring. Anybody who wants one, they're free to be taking, but you gotta get over here and get them out of here, you know, fairly efficiently. So um, Rhodes Arnold, who was one of our founding energy sources here, um, sent a letter expressing our interest. We were uh, granted permission and uh, he sent a delegation over and they picked the best of the lot um, and then set about uh, um, amassing the resources to get it back right. there. Uh, they ended up getting the fuel sponsored by Union 76, and there were several reserve pilots across the street in uh, davis Monthan Air Force Base who had actually been Liberator crew during the war who volunteered to do the ferry flight. Right. So, yeah, they picked it up, and this was before any of the other major museums picked up any of these. So <clears throat> they got their volunteer crew. Rhodes Arnold went out for part of the flight, and they started heading west, So, yeah. which required them to, well, fly near and or over Pakistan, which apparently, th the story goes, a couple of Pakistani F-86 Sabres intercepted the aircraft, wondering why there was an Indian maritime bomber flying yeah. over their space. Yeah, so they, they, they actually started a gun pass um, and probably would have been shot down had the American crew not put two giant American flags on the vertical stabilizers on each side of the airplane uh, while leaving the Indian markings on it. So the, uh, the crew were instructed to land. They landed in Karachi, and after several days of diplomatic negotiations and discussions, they were uh, cleared to depart for the rest of their leg in their flight and were escorted out of Pakistan by the pa same Pakistani uh, sabers that <laughs> intercepted them. Um, after several more legs hopping uh, across Europe and over the North Atlantic through Gander, Newfoundland, um, it ended up here in Tucson in the summer of 1969 and was greeted by Jimmy Doolittle and many other local dignitaries. Right, and its last stop before coming here was Dallas Fort Worth at the same factory that built this aircraft. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was one of the earliest aircraft that we acquired. And we talked a little bit about Rhodes Arnold. He really was one of the driving forces behind the collection of this museum collection in its early stages. Before him, really everything that was in the collection was mostly Air Force and Navy loan artifacts. Um, he got us the BT-13 from the University it's of Arizona. Yep. Or not, I'm sorry, Tucson High because yeah. it was a technical aircraft for their training school. Yep. And, you know, he was the one who really started amassing a movement to get more aircraft for this collection. So, And he wasn't discriminating. His, his ethos, and actually, you know, the board and the organization at the time recognized that there was a lot of rich aviation history. I mean, it was, it was the 1960s and early 70s. I mean, aviation, you know, Wright Brothers, 1903. So uh, a lot had happened, and they were very conscious of this, and they made an expressed effort to not have us be purely a military-themed organization and sought out commercial, civil, and experimental aircraft 
uh, as best they could uh, with the resources that they had. Um, so the poor old B24 sat outside here for many, many years with its plexiglass yellowing, but still loved. Um, in the mid-1980s, as the uh, World War II veterans groups were reaching retirement age and had affluence and, and, uh, and, and interest, um, you know, we got introduced to several different associations and the 446 Bomb Group um, partnered with our organization in the late 1980s to help fundraise for the building that's here. So their condition of the fundraising is that one side of our B-24 be painted in 446 Bomb Group colors. Um, and again, which is slightly fictional and I'll let Andrew <laughs> talk right, about the right. nose art. So that's the interesting thing about this nose art is this is supposed to represent an aircraft that was the lead aircraft on D-Day, and that's what that six bomb marker is up there. Yeah. And I believe they were the lead group for the 8th Air Force, so it would have been one of the first aircraft going over that morning. Yeah. Well, the thing in daylight. is, in day, well, yes, in daylight. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Scott. Yeah. Can't yeah. forget yeah. about Commonwealth. Yeah. Now, its original nose art name was Red Ass. Yeah. And that was what the donkey was. But apparently, they did not want to report Red Ass in the newspaper articles and stuff like that. So Bungay Buckaroo was actually the nick, kind of like the nickname of the unit's mascot. At their base, they had this huge like mural cowboy of a cowboy on uh, a horse, uh, yeah. like out in the southwest yeah. somewhere, and he was called the Bungay Buckaroo because Bungay was their home station. So <clears throat> I don't think there was ever actually a flying Bungay Buckaroo. It was red ass, and it was only red ass. But I think for the guys too, they wanted to have something that kind of showed... represented everybody, yes, and not just exactly. One crew. So. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so yeah. you get in a lot of interesting things when it comes to paint schemes in a museum sometimes because yeah. it's not all yeah. as straightforward as one thinks. Yeah, but on the uh, starboard side of the aircraft, we preserved it in Indian Air Force 6 Squadron markings as it arrived. Um, the airplane is as it arrived. It had, it had its complete military configuration. Everything that went into the factory in Fort Worth that the RAF used, that the Indian Air Force used, is still here. And as Andrew touched on before, the only exception is the ball turret, which was installed to uh, have it representative of the 446 and more broadly representative of Liberator combat configuration versus the H2S radar that it was originally configured with. Um, so it is our, again, it's, a, it's, it's one of our pride and joys. It's a very, very rare aircraft. I think there's, what, something like a half a dozen B-24Js in, in the world. Give or take maybe it. a couple more. I mean, yeah. just from the, in, the ones from India alone, you have the Canadian one, you have the Royal Air Force Museum, you have ours, Foundation. you have Collings Foundation, and you have the former Talashay, now Kermit Week. So five, yeah, and I think there's one in India still. Yep. And then there's a few other- The Air Force Museum has, there's several in the- Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the other ones that are around were not, but there's one at the Air Force Museum, yeah. one at Barksdale, one at Imperial War Museum. So we can round it up a little bit, yeah, but there but, we go. So anyway, but we are very fortunate to have a very unique and diverse uh, representation of uh, World War II Allied and Axis aircraft uh, presented in our collection. Mm -hmm.